is um, uh, okay. Uh, the question of military aid hasn't changed. It was under President Obama, actually, that this enormous escalation to $3.8 billion a year was, was agreed for a ten, at least a 10-year period. It will probably go up for the next 10 years. But then remember what happened when Donald Trump came into office. He came into office with two very contradictory things. On the one hand, he was engaging with and supporting and enabling these incredible anti-Semitic organizations across the United States neo-Nazis and the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and all of them. The people that, in, remember in 2017, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, these, these fascists, these neo-Nazis with their tiki torches marching and shouting, Jews will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. And what does Donald Trump say? He says they are very fine people, right? So on the one hand, it's incredible levels of anti-Semitism. On the other hand, he embraces Israel and says, I will be and I am the most pro-Israeli president this country has ever had. And he goes to Israel in 2018, and he proceeds to change a bunch of laws in the US. So he says, number one, we're going to move the embassy from Tel Aviv, where it had been for many, many decades, and where all other international embassies are located. We're going to move it to Jerusalem, which the Israelis claim as their capital, but which is not recognized as their capital anywhere else in the world because it's on occupied territory. We're going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. Number two, he says, settlements are now legal, according to the United States, despite the clear violation of international law and UN resolutions, many of which the US actually signed over the years. Then he said, the occupation of the Golan Heights is now recognized as legitimate by us, by, by the US. That's now our policy. And it said, if there is future annexation in the West Bank, that's fine too. So he reverses a bunch of laws. And when Joe Biden comes in, he says, I don't agree with any of that. This was all wrong. He said it as a candidate. And he said it again when he came into office. But he didn't do anything to change it. So these are now Biden's positions. He says he doesn't agree with them. And you know that's fine. But frankly, I don't care whether he agrees or not. He has done nothing. And these are not things that require uh, um, uh, congressional engagement. He could do these at the stroke of a pen. And he's chosen not to, because I think he still believes that it's a, a matter of political suicide to criticize Israel. I think he doesn't recognize how much the discourse has changed. And this is the last part of what I want to talk about, is how much the discourse has changed. Because the good news is, despite how bad things are and it, are getting even worse on the ground for Palestinians. More people being killed, more homes being demolished, more settlements being built, more checkpoints being established, more land being stripped. The two-state solution is a myth. There's no longer any possibility of it. Whether you think it was a good thing or a bad thing, it's too late. There's no land left for a state. But if we look at the discourse in this country, it's changed ex in extraordinary ways. It's amazing, huge changes at the public level, significant changes at the, at the media level, and emerging, growing changes at the policy level. So let me give you just a few examples of, of what, this, what this looks like. And this is partly in the context of the human rights organizations taking you know, new initiatives around this, the work of Palestinian rights organizations taking this on over the last decades, so number one, it, the issue of support for Israel has become what AIPAC and other parts of the pro-Israel lobby, AIPAC, uh, KUFI, the Christians United for Israel, and other parts of it, have always wanted it to be a nonpartisan issue. Well, guess what? It's not anymore. It's now a Republican issue. And if you look at what the, what the polls indicate, there was a, a poll in um, the University of uh, Maryland poll in 2019 66% of Democrats said that the U.S. should take real action against illegal settlements. 76% of Republicans said the U.S. should do nothing or should issue statements with no, with no action. So it's, it's that kind of clear uh, um, uh, partisan focus. Another, the, Pew poll, the Pew poll in 2019, two to one, Republicans favor the Israeli government, view it favorably. Two-thirds of Democrats view it unfavorably. So it's a completely partisan issue at this point. 
One of my favorites in 2010, this was early in this process of transforming the discourse. 2010, another poll. This is in the middle of the summer when uh, um, President, uh, President Obama was having a lot of problems with Bibi Netanyahu. Netanyahu was treating him in the most racist ways imaginable. It was outrageous. It led, among other things, to 60 members of the Black Caucus of Congress boycotting the speech that the Republicans invited Netanyahu to give at the, at the, um, uh, in, in Congress. But in the middle of that, when a lot of the press was, oh my god, Obama is going to throw Israel under the bus. Oh my god, this is going to be terrible for Israel. That was how a lot of it was being covered. At the height of that, in this poll, the question was, it said, Israelis are building settlements across the West Bank. Which of the following sentences best describes what you think about that? So sentence number one says, Israelis are building settlements for security, and they have the right to build wherever they want. Sentence number two says, Israelis are building settlements on expropriated land, and the land should be, uh, the, the settlements should be knocked down, and the land returned to its original owners. Now that's a very extreme statement. It happens to match international law, but you could say it in a, you know, a not so extreme sounding way. But they deliberately said it in the most extreme way possible. And in that poll, 63% of Democrats chose door number two, that it should, the settlement should be torn down and the land returned to its original owners. 62% uh, of Republicans said Israel's, Israelis have the right to build wherever they want. And then just one more poll. This was in 2021, so just a couple of years ago. The poll was conducted by the Jewish Electorate Institute, which basically just does polling of the Jewish community in the United States. And in that poll, July of 2021, 25% of American Jews said that they believe Israel is an apartheid state. And 34% said the treatment of Palestinians is similar to the racist treatment in the United States of black people. And 22% said Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. So the massive shift in discourse is underway. It should be reflected in all the media. It, sh it isn't. It should be reflected in how Congress votes. They're supposed to represent us, right? They don't. But I will give a couple of examples where it's just beginning to, to come out in the policy world. So some began in 2018, when you had the election of a number of young, particularly young women of color, who were elected to Congress saying explicitly, I support Palestinian rights. I support Israel, and I support Palestinian rights. I'm against occupation, et cetera. That was a game changer. That had, you had never had that before from members of Congress as a group. As a matter of course, it wasn't like some big deal. They weren't mostly working on that issue all the time, but that was their position. One is a Palestinian, as you know, Rashida Tlaib. Another is a Muslim Arab. You know, and so it was, there's another, uh, two other African American women. So, you know, all of this came together to, to have some real impact on how the discussions go forward in Congress. Then in 2021, when the Israelis again attacked Gaza, Gazans were being killed under Israeli bombs, there was a call for a ceasefire. And the Biden administration said, no, we don't need a ceasefire yet. We, you know, that's, that's for later. We, in response to that, 12 Jewish members of the House of Representatives, none of whom had in the past emerged as great supporters of Palestinian rights in any way, sent a letter to Biden challenging him and saying there must be a ceasefire. Their, you know, their letter was very clear, we support Israel, we support Israel's right of self-defense, and you must call for a ceasefire. That was pretty unprecedented. A day later, 25 senators sent a similar letter, all Democrats, challenging their own president, their own party. And my favorite one, 500 members of the staff of Biden's campaign, the people who actually put him in office, right, the people who worked those 23-hour days and slept one hour and went back to work to get him elected, 500 of them wrote this incredible letter to him that didn't just say, you need to call for a ceasefire, but condemned the Israeli assault on Gaza, said that it was linked to 74 years of oppression of Palestinians. It was an extraordinary statement. So all of this was kind of under the radar. It wasn't, it wasn't on the front pages, even though it represented an extraordinary shift in, uh, in, in how, uh, how all of this is, is moving forward. So the last point is, what's the response to this? One response is coming from longtime supporters of Israel, 
those who lobby in Congress and others, who are becoming very frightened that they are losing the initiative, particularly among young people. Organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace is now the fastest growing Jewish organization. And it is explicitly defined as, as supporting Palestinian rights. And one of the things that's happening as a result is that there is an effort to weaponize the charge of anti-Semitism at a moment when real anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, is on the rise. We saw it in Pittsburgh. We saw it in San Diego. We saw it in, in Charlottesville. When this is on the rise, anti-Semitism rooted in white supremacy. You know, this is, goes back to the origins of the Ku Klux Klan in the South, who targeted African Americans particularly and secondarily targeted Jews. Jews were lynched in 1898 and again in 2015. Not in anywhere near the numbers, not the thousands. 4,000 African Americans had been lynched. Three Jews were lynched. But that's horrific to think about. And instead of targeting how anti-Semitism emerges from white supremacy, there's this claim that now the real threat comes from people who are talking about Palestinian rights, none of whom are carrying out violent attacks against Jews or anybody else. But by weaponizing this charge of anti-Semitism, people have lost jobs, people have been accused of anti-Semitism in, in really vicious ways, because maybe second to being called a racist, being called an anti-Semite is one of the worst things you can possibly call someone in this country, as it should be, as it should be. So when someone is called a, an anti-Semite and it's false, it's an enormous price to pay. And part of that price is it undermines our ability to fight against real anti-Semitism. So all of this is bound up with the need to fight real anti-Semitism. And I will end by just saying that I think young Rachel Corey, who would be 43 years old today, would be very proud to see how this discourse has changed. But there's a lot of work ahead to make it really change the policy to change things on the ground. Thank you. Great. Again, thanks so much for your clarity and your commitment and your courage in all of these issues. So want to um, call up our, our dear colleague, uh, Stephanie Nannis from Political Science, who's going to give us a, a few commentaries, questions, uh, and then we'll have time, hopefully, for all of your insights and questions, obviously, with students getting first priority. You're paying the big bucks, so we'll call on you first. There is a mic in the middle here. Stephanie. How's, it, how's this? How's this? Good. Um, well, we'll have a lot of time for questions. I don't have very <laughs> um, I, I So thank you for, you covered so much in a really, as someone who tries to teach about this, I, I have a real uh, admiration for people who can pull that together in such a good way. Um, and I, I remember Rachel Corey. I mean, I'm old enough to remember how, how absolutely shocking it was to have a young person literally plowed under uh, by a bulldozer. She was. She was wearing a bright orange vest, and the justification was that somehow the driver couldn't see her. He's driving a bulldozer that he can't see out of. So um, um, I, I remember that. Um, I, again, the, 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 I, I don't have... Um, yeah, I, th I think I'd only like to elaborate or, or just add some things. I think the one thing that I uh, sort of in my mind uh, was questioning and I'd like to look into in terms of the current uh, Israeli government, so I have two people from my Arab-Israeli conflict class who somehow couldn't coordinate that with my class. <laughs> but um, so we've spent a lot of time in that class looking at the current situation in Israel. Um, it is indeed the most far-right government that Israel has ever seen, although all of those trends existed within Israeli politics, so there's nothing new about their existence, um, but the fact that, yeah, that this is the first Israeli government ever, I guess, that didn't have any kind of centrist ballast to it is indeed um, significant. Um, I'm not, I don't know about the resounding, I'd, I'd like to look at the percentages, because I've read other stuff where that that it's not necessarily representative of like sort of the way, um, I mean, Israel has a PR um, 
system, but that somehow they were able to put a coalition which doesn't necessarily represent that majority. But I, I leave it as a question, <laughs> not, not necessarily um, a disagreement. Um, and um, again, you know, the fact that these enormous protests, and I have some friends in Israel who did, she sent me some pictures, like, oh, we're left, we're right, we're everything, we're everything. Indeed, they are not touching at all the Palestinian issue. That would be the third rail, and it would probably kind of, um, yeah, it's very much about their country, right? It's not. Um, um, I would be interested to uh, explore with you this question of more expulsions, right? Because um, sort of, I mean, I think what might be useful or interesting, again, sort of looking to the future um, within the U.S., I mean, I thought it was interesting in terms of U.S. policy, but in terms of on the ground in Israel-Palestine, I know in my class one of the things we're about to start talking about now that we've slogged through the history, <laughs> um, we're about to start looking at sort of the single state, like the very fact that the two-state solution is dead, or, or it's it's in a coma or it's a zombie, like it's a zombie, because it actually keeps, you, you, people talk about it, right? So it, it, it I, so students, when you're reading about it, there'll be some mention of the two-state solution, right? So it still kind of exists in some sort of, fa I don't know if it's even a fantasy, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I remember I was doing some field work in Jordan, which is where I've done most of my field work, and I was at a talk um, by someone who's from the quartet, so this is, this is back when there was a peace process, right? <laughs> so-called peace process. Um, and I had just been in the West Bank, and when you're in the West Bank, you can see the settlements. They're, they're neighborhoods. They're, they're, you know, this whole idea that those settlements are gonna get removed for a Palestinian state is fantastical to anybody who's seeing what's going on on the ground. And he kept, and I asked him, I said, what, when do we, I asked, when do we declare the two-state solution dead? Like when, when, when do we sort and he said when the international community says it is he got my question like he kind of looked uncomfortable he smiled like he we got it and he said when the international community says it is um and so students when you're reading you should should know that is still somehow the official framework i mean as recently as what yesterday by like you'll hear them talk about it um um but now it it serves more as a cover for inaction than anything else um so I don't know, maybe when in your cut to sort of think about what that future looks like, I mean, um, um, is important. Um, I was glad you talked about how the discourse changed. I definitely noticed that in the 2021 war um, that you had members of Congress, you know, sort of saying those kinds of things um, on a personal level. In terms of the discourse, I think it was that war, so I, I have a, I, at the time she was a toddler, three or something, I was on the playground with one of the other mothers who does work in nothing even related to politics or these politics, and as soon as that war broke out, she said it was all over her social media. Like, so in all sorts of places, and it was all Palest like pro-Palestine or whatever, pro whatever that means. Um, so yeah, that, that is also very challenging, but it will still, to, to do something about that aid that goes to Israel, like sort of whether, like, you know, what it is, so I was trying to think about the U.S. role. So obviously it's, it's that money, that's the amount of money, uh, protection of Israel and international bodies. Um, but the money is the thing that we, we might have some control over theoretically as citizens, and that has proven really difficult. But I wonder, you know, you know what that would mean. And I, I wonder, I'm not sure if the current controversy, if, if, I'm just throwing this out here, you can see what Phyllis says, um, part of at least the rhetoric around the Israeli-U.S.-Israel relationship is that it's the only democracy in the Middle East, they're, they're democracy and democracy. As soon as that veil falls, and it's so, <laughs> like, it's so blatant, like, at a certain point, like, I, I have to believe this, but maybe it's not true, like, that blatant hypocrisy, we now live in a world where blatant hypocrisy is, <laughs> there's nothing to be done about it, but, um, yeah, I, I, that that would somehow at least open up a bigger space for a conversation about that funding, um, which may not, in fact, necessarily change Israeli policy, and it may not actually change Israeli capacity to do what it's doing, but it would exact a higher price from Israel. So, 
Um, um, yeah, and sort of the statement of, of Hawara and settler attacks um, on Palestinian villages. Again, we're still sort of getting through uh, a history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we just finished a section about these kinds of attacks in the 1980s, sounding ex exactly like what happened to Hawara. I mean, set settlers going on, like, um, in, in response, in response to Kit Lake, sort of these revenge, retaliations for retaliations, um, but ones in which Israeli settlers, um, there were very few prices that they paid for their violence, and an extraordinary price that Palestinians played, paid um, um, for theirs. Um, I, I don't have any more. Like, I, I sort of, I guess, one last thing, sort of this question of of expulsions. Um, Again, to, to talk about expulsions or Palestinians becoming refugees in 1948 and 1967, those all happened in a situation of war, under a cover of war. So few, like, the, so the, the way, um, my understanding is the way it's discussed in um, Israeli politics is transfer. They, they obviously don't use the word expulsion. They use the word transfer. It's talking about a po transfer of population. Um, an idea that used to again exist on the fringes in the dark corners of Israeli public discourse, which has now come un close, like into the light, um, or sort of um, become more normalized. Um, um, yeah, that I guess it's just for you to put that on the the radar and to sort of be conscious of that. Um, just yeah, just sort of made me wonder if, or just made me think about as things heat up in the West Bank, you know, would that provide enough of a cover? I, I don't, I don't know yet. So, thank you for a great talk. So I don't have more controversy for you, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here to. Um, if there are any questions, I'm always conscious. Like, I always assume students. I'm around if there are any other sort of questions, but um, I have nothing else. <laughs> thank you. Right. Can I can I just say one more thing? Today we're discussing the Oslo peace process in 2:40 at at 2:40, and um, again, this is kind of like for the, for those of us who are older and remember it, um, it. It's just so 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 the Oslo peace process. I now I can't remember. Like it, it was in that there was an, an effort um, by Israelis and Palestinians in the 1990s. Um, and they were the farthest efforts that had ever been taken. Again, doing in in historical <laughs> retrospect, it's clear all the challenges. It's uh, the challenges. Um, maybe they were doomed from the start. I'm not sure. Okay, so we. <laughs> she's like they were doomed from the start. I'm willing to give it a question mark. Um, but um, but yeah, um, sort of little little. Yeah. We'll have Philly respond. Yeah. This is great. Thank you, Stephanie. These, uh, these are really good. Can I start from the bottom and go up instead of the other way around? Okay. So Oslo. Yeah. Yes, it was doomed from the start. I wrote my first critique of Oslo the day after they were signed and said this is never going to work because it was, it was a false claim. I mean, what they, And one of the things that's still the case when you hear the, the 2SS, the two-state solution, you have to look at what it actually called for. If it, you know, is there, there was a time you could imagine right after the 67 war, the first time when it was first occupied, there could have been a state built on that. It wouldn't have been necessarily ultimately just, but it, was, it would be viable. It would be contiguous, it would be viable, some kind of connection between the West Bank and Gaza. That stopped being possi possible in about 1968, like a year later when all the settlements started going up. Under labor governments, we should be clear. It's not just the right in Israel that's responsible for this. This is, you know, this is a bipartisan thing there. But the thing with Oslo, what it envisioned as the Palestinian state would have no control of its own borders, no control of its territorial waters, no control of entry and exit of anyone, no, not allowed to have an army, not control of its own um, electrical grid. All of that would be under Israeli control. And Israel militarily would be allowed to enter it at any time for any reason it saw fit. That was their definition of what would be a Palestinian state. So the notion of two equal states living side by side was never on anybody's agenda, right? It was a, an Israeli state with all the trappings of a state, 
and a something over here <laughs> that we would call a state. At one point, they even offered, I don't know how many of you have been to the region, but there's a little town outside of Bethlehem called uh, Abu Dis. It's a dusty little Palestinian town with not much to, you know, to promote, shall we say. But the Israeli position was, we'll give you Abu Dis, and you can call it Al Quds. You can call it Jerusalem, which is essentially like saying, we'll give you Newark, and you can call it New York. You know, I mean, no offense to New Jerseyans, but you know what I mean. I mean this was the same thing. I mean, Abu Dis, friends of mine live in Abu Dis. It's a perfectly decent little town, but it's a, you know, it's a small, poor town that is not Jerusalem. Whatever else you want to say about it, it's not Jerusalem. So Oslo was never going to fly. The thing about only democracy, I think, is very, very vulnerable right now. In the discourse in the Israeli English language press from sort of center left, like Haaretz, all the way to the far right, they're all writing, including articles, saying this is going to be a boon for anti-Zionists. This is going to be a boon for Palestinian rights. It's going to be a boon for the movements against what we're doing in the occupied territories, all of that because it's showing the real face of it, right? So I think that this is an opportunity in a perverse kind of way for us. You know, the, the Biden administration has made clear they don't want to meet with Smotrich. They did everything possible to the, except prohibit him from coming, which they could have done, but they didn't, which I actually don't support, so that's fine with me. But they, they have refused to meet with him. And they've said, we're not going to meet with anybody from those parties, from those extremist parties. So this is um, a moment for that. Um, on the question of aid, just the last point, aid is probably the hardest thing because uh, it's the most overt. It's the thing that members of Congress see as we have to vote for this. If we don't vote for anything else, we have to vote for this. The reality is they don't. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a, a uh, question of political suicide anymore, if it ever was. And I would point to the one bill that is pending, Betty McCollum who many of you may not have ever heard of. She's not one of the squad. She's not even a member of the Progressive Caucus, in fact. She defines herself as a middle-aged, middle-class woman from a middle-something uh, middle city in the middle of the country. <laughs> she represents St. Paul, Minnesota, right? And she has an incredible commitment to human rights. And when she talks about it, she says, my constituents want me to protect human rights everywhere and not make exceptions. So I want to treat Israel the way we treat every other country. And she's had a bill that's been put forward now three terms. It's uh, up again. I forget the number of it. But Betty's bill would essentially make sure that no part of the US aid money, no part of that $3.8 billion every year, is used to fund the juvenile military detention system or to demolish the homes of families with children. So it's very mild. It doesn't call for cutting the budget. It doesn't call for ending military aid. I sometimes wish it did. But it doesn't. It's a step. It's a huge step forward. And it's coming from this very middle-range, mid-range Democrat, if you will, uh, person in Congress. And it has 30, I think 32 co-sponsors this time around. It's not close to passing yet, but it's getting a lot closer than it ever was before. So that is something we should be keeping in mind. Um, the two-state solution, yeah. Uh, it does allow the claim that, that we have an idea for a solution. This is the solution. It's the UN position. It's the US position. It's, they're claiming the quartet still exists. The quartet, for those of you not old enough to remember, was one of these ridiculous um, uh, diplomatic fake instruments that was made up of four parties right? that were going to come up with the best solution. So who are the four parties? The United States, Russia, this is like a week after the Soviet Union had collapsed. So it's the United States, Russia, um, the United Nations, and the European Union. So you have like a bunch of states on the one hand, you have a bunch of states over here, you have, it made no sense, it never made any sense, and it never really claimed it made any sense, but they kept meeting, and then it kind of faded away. And I just heard like two or three days ago, the quartet is having a meeting somewhere. Who knew? You know, it's like, what the hell? I have no idea what that was about. But the two-state solution as an actual solution, meaning there's some modicum of justice, ain't even on the, it's not on the table. The question of expulsions and transfer, you're right, transfer is the more contemporary term. It was also used by the Nazis. It was their first goal before they began the final solution and the Holocaust, before they started slaughtering Jews, 
the goal was to transfer them out of their territory, to make that territory what they called Jewish free, Judenrein. So that's where they took the, I mean, it's shocking that the Israeli government took that term, but they did. And in 2005, Ariel Sharon, who was then the prime minister, he started talking about this new theme called Jordan is Palestine, meaning all the Palestinians should leave. They should go to Jordan. They've got this whole other country there. We just have, we want just this little country for the Jews. It's our only country. Leaving out history, leaving out all the Jews around the world who want no part of being part of a Sparta country somewhere, you know, and just said all the all the Palestinians should leave. They should go to they should go to to uh, to Jordan, and there were hints that those who didn't make that choice would be encouraged, shall we say? So yes, this question of of transfer, the question of expulsion, is very much still on the covered agenda. But it's in my view likely to as soon as this government is confident that the current situation it finds itself in, which is that there is no there is no consequence for these policies that they're taking. You know, they are moving to destroy the independence of the, of the judiciary, all of that, and there's no consequence to it. As soon as they feel comfortable that they can go even further, they will do so. That's the real danger that, that we're talking about. And then finally, the, the question of um, the coalition and representation. I think you're, you may well be right that on the exact numbers relative to the exact poll figures, it may not match exactly. But where it does match is that there is an enormous shift to the right across class, across generations, across gender, across geography, across everything in Israeli Jewish society. And what we're seeing now is that some of the, it's not every person in the country, obviously. There is still a kind of centrist component there. And what they're doing, this is like, for example, the startup nation is, is becoming get us out of here nation because there's a huge capital flow out right now that's been going on for the last two weeks where these tech startups are saying our capital isn't safe here. There's going to be a run on the banks. We're not going to be able to get international loans. We're taking our capital and going elsewhere because they're not particularly loyal to Israel for any ideological or religious or any other purposes. They just founded a good, convenient place to launch their businesses. And now it's not looking so convenient, so they're going elsewhere. They may end up in Long Island, who knows? Come on, guys. Students first. It's a, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. What can, what can people actually do? What can students do? The bottom line is there's no, I hate to use a military term, but there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing we can all do, and that will transform things. The transformation does happen over time, and the price is paid by people on the ground, children, elders, who are being killed in huge numbers, whose homes are being destroyed. There's no magic way of stopping that right now. What there is, is education. People don't know these things. In some communities, people talk about it. In, certainly in Arab communities, in Palestinian communities, in Muslim communities, in many Jewish communities. This is being discussed all the time. But we can't pretend that people across the country, everybody is talking about it all the time. These days, if people are talking about an international issue at all, they're talking about Ukraine. 
and they're looking at how Ukrainian refugees are being treated, which is exactly how all refugees should be treated. The problem is Palestinian refugees aren't treated that way. Afghan refugees aren't treated that way. Somali refugees aren't treated that way. And what we're seeing with Ukrainian refugees when they are being met at borders with warm coats and, and hot soup and toys for the children and promises of you can stay in my house for two years, this is what every refugee in the world deserves. This is what international law requires. And yet, we see this disparity. So that's one way of talking about it. It's talking about why aren't we worried about Palestinian refugees and Afghan refugees and others to the same degree that we're worried about Ukrainian refugees. So that's one of the talking points, if you will, that we can, that we can use. The other thing is about education in films, for instance. There's a there's big campaign, some of you have probably heard them at various points, against the so-called BDS movement. BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. It's a set of nonviolent tools used by social movements around the world to bring pressure to bear on Israel to stop its violations of international law. So it can be everything from boycotting Sabra Hummus in the, in the, in the uh, student cafeteria to huge boycotts against Caterpillar Bulldozer for its role in the killing of Rachel Corey, for instance. There's all kinds of campaigns. There's a great um, website called Who Profits that lists all of these corporations, US corporations, Israeli corporations, other international corporations, that are making a profit in the occupied territories, profiting from occupation. So that's another kind of campaign. And one of the things that I think is important about that in terms of looking at what it, what's the price that gets paid, there are laws being, being debated and passed in 30 states now in the US that would make it illegal, either criminal charge in a few, in more cases it's not criminal, but it would, for example, in Texas, there's a law that prohibits any company from having a contract with the, um, well, I'll give you the example in, in Arkansas. In Arkansas, there's a law that says no one can have a contract with the state uh, unless they sign this form that says, I am not and will never boycott Israel. And it's like, do we have a First Amendment here? What is this? And of course, the Supreme Court, back in 1955, after the, the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, has said that boycotts are protected free speech. And yet, all these uh, laws are being passed. And in the case of, the, of Arkansas, it involved the, the publisher of a, uh, the statewide newspaper. It's called the Arkansas Gazette, I think. And he had never boycotted Israel, had no interest in boycotting Israel, no intention of boycotting Israel. But he gets this thing from the state government, which used to take out ads in his paper for job openings or whatever it was. And they said, we can't take out any more ads until you sign this agreement. He's like, I'm not signing that. You know, it's got nothing to do with me. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I have a First Amendment right to boycott whoever I want. I'm not boycotting. I don't intend to. But So he is one of the three examples in this terrific film that was just uh, uh, released called Boycott. Good name. Uh, and it's available streaming. You can, you know, somebody can pay the $4 to rent it and show it to on campus. You know, show it a few days during, during lunch to show people what it means when nonviolent activities like this are met with criminalization. You know, if they don't want us to use nonviolent activities, what are they saying we should do? Just stay quiet? Actually, yeah, that's sort of what they're saying, you know. But the other example is what do Palestinians face? You know, in 2018, a group of young Gazans, led by an extraordinary poet, got together and said, you know, it, we're, we've been living our whole lives in this, in this open air prison which is completely also surrounded by a wall. We can't leave. The Only the Israelis can give them permission to leave, or in some cases, the Egyptians, who are just as bad as the Israelis on this one. And they said, we're going to march nonviolently to show that we, we have rights to just claim our, our ability to, to be people in this terrible situation. And they organized a set of every week. They started marching towards the fence, towards the, the, the wall that the Israelis had put up. And the Israelis, when it was announced, said, if you march towards that wall, you will be shot. We will bring sharpshooters. And they did it anyway. They didn't try and climb the wall. They didn't attack the wall. They marched in their own territory inside Gaza, which is occupied despite the fact that Israeli soldiers pulled out. They now surround it rather than being inside. They're outside, but they still, it's, it's a, a siege of Gaza. And in that time, 
I forget the numbers, it was 214 people were killed by the sharpshooters who just came and mowed people down week after week after week, and they kept coming and coming and coming. Journalists, healthcare workers, ambulance drivers, old people, children, 157, I think, ended up having legs and arms amputated after being shot at close range. And 33,000 over that time were injured in some way with tear gas, with rubber bullets, with live ammunition, with something. So the price they've paid for nonviolent protest, you, you come back to what are we supposed to do, right? So it's educating people about what that all means. That's what we can do now. That's yeah. what we can do. I think it's like a little disheartening sometimes because especially yeah. knowing how long this has been going on and having been to Gaza and seeing it, it's like you're fighting and there's no change. And even like you said, educating the people is a big thing. And especially in the Hofstra community, sometimes you mentioned how it may be political suicide to speak. Sometimes even No, I said it's not anymore. Oh, it's not political. It's not political I suicide anymore. I think at this time it's not, but in the past yes. it definitely was. And even for Hofstra, like having this talk is a really big step. But sometimes it can be with your professors having different views as you or very like prominent figures speaking about things you disagree with. It can be a little scary to talk about sure. so I think it's really good that you came thank you and thank also you. for the film boycott is a really good one and there's another one on Netflix called Farha yeah. and that deals with um, kind of takes you a coming of age story of a young Palestinian girl and seeing her whole family get killed and having to live the life that many others live so it's a great film and it's one that's based on a true story yeah uh, from the mother of the filmmaker so yeah thank you for that thank you thank you for that Hello. Hi. Um, this is a very hard topic to talk about. And I'm an Arab, and where I grew up, the big talk is that Israel is this conqueror for like oppressing Palestinian people. And that's partly true, but partly there's a lot of anti Semitism. <laughs> I don't want to be the dramatic one. It's okay. <laughs> and I guess I wanna. I'm Eric too. And I feel you. We're good. <laughs> I wanna navigate the very one sided, very anti Semitic world I grew up with, with the reality of what is going on, and that has led me to, like, just ignore it, but now I'm trying to, like, learn and navigate through that, and I'm wondering, like, what are your thoughts? Mm. Thank you for that. It's a really important question, and it's one that a lot of people face, so I appreciate that. I think, for me, the key is to start with human rights. And that applies to everybody. Everybody should have the same rights, right? And one of the, the denial of rights that we're seeing in this country right now is a huge escalation of anti-Semitism. So fighting against anti-Semitism is really important. It's one of the things I do. It's one of the things my organizations do. And there's a lot of this and. It's not so much this but. It's this and. The and is... Israel is a terribly oppressive society against Palestinians within its own country, those under military occupation, and the millions now, refugees, who have been denied their right to go home. That's a right, too, in international law. So I think the key is it's not anti-Semitic to talk about Israel as an oppressive actor against Palestinians. It's a state. It should be treated like every other state. It can claim it's the state of all the Jews, but, excuse me, not all the Jews accept that little gift or whatever it's supposed to be. It is a state of its citizens, like every other state. And when it refuses to be that, it shouldn't be given special treatment. You know, For example, if Saudi Arabia, which defines itself as an Islamic kingdom, uh, if it defined all the criticism of 
Saudi Arabia, which is legion for all the right reasons, because it's a terribly human rights violating government, if that was always defined as, and that's uh, Islamophobic or anti-Arab racism, that would be way wrong. We're criticizing, condemning a government that maybe talks about being the, you know, the most important part of, the, of the, the Muslim world. That's up to Muslims to define which is their most important part. But as a state, it's operating as a government. And so when our government sells them weapons, for instance, we damn well have the right to say, no, we're not going to sell weapons to a country that's assaulting other Muslims, by, as it turns out, in Yemen, for instance. And there's nothing Islamophobic or, or anti-Arab about that. Similarly, saying that the state of Israel is carrying out an apartheid system is not anti-Semitic. It's anti-apartheid. In the same way that in all the years of the anti-apartheid movement around South Africa and Namibia, nobody ever accused that movement of being anti-white, anti-white people, or anti-Africans. It was anti-apartheid. And similarly, I mean, when we talk about what could a solution look like, it could look like the solution that was used in South Africa, which is the notion of destroying the system of apartheid and leaving the country unified and intact. They haven't succeeded by a long shot along, you know, across the board, but they've managed pretty well to get rid of the, the political uh, uh, and racialized versions of, of um, apartheid that existed. So now it's, you know, there is apartheid, but it's, it's more economic apartheid, if you will. And that's a long struggle that's still going on, and it will go on for a long time. If there were going to be a struggle against apartheid, what does it mean? It means a struggle for equality in Israel and Palestine. And you could imagine that could be either equality for all within one state, from the river to the sea, or equality within and between two states, which isn't, as I mentioned, on anybody's agenda. Nobody's really offering that. So it's really, for me, it's about equality. I've always been a supporter of one state, but it wasn't up to me. You know, I'm a Jewish girl from California. I don't get to say how many states there should be, or, you know, it's like not my business. Um, but some of the stuff they do, they, say, they claim to be doing in my name. So I get, you know, I have to at least say, uh, sorry, that's not in my name, you know. So there's, there's all that. But I, I really appreciate you recognizing the, the importance of not allowing an anti-Semitic component to slip in. But it is really important to recognize that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. And you know, one of the things, when I was spending a lot of time in the occupied territories, when I was working on my first book, it was during the first intifada, and Palestinians in the West Bank at that time were in and out of Israel all the time. There was no wall, it was, you know, moving was, was not the problem. There were other problems, but that wasn't one. And so they interacted a lot with Israelis. And they tended to use the same language that Israelis use, which tends to speak of Jews. We Jews are doing X, Y, and Z, rather than we Israelis. There, some would use that, but more used Jews. So the Palestinians tended to use that too. And people would say, the Jews destroyed my house, the Jews arrested my father, you know, whatever it was. And I remember a couple of points starting to feel like, okay, enough with the Jews stuff, you know, <laughs> and saying to a couple of different people at different times, you know I'm Jewish, right? and they would look kind of quizzical, and one of them said, I thought you come from New York. <laughs> I said, I do come from New York, but I'm Jewish. And he said, well, what's that got to do with anything? And he immediately understood that that wasn't about religion, it was about the Israelis that were doing this stuff, and they just used the, the term. But we do have to be careful that the term doesn't get used in a sloppy way that makes it, you know, track anti-Semitic tropes of various sorts. You know, because you look at like what, what Trump did, you know, anti-Semitism was on the rise and pro-Israel policies on the rise all at the same time, and he saw no contradiction, you know. And then he relied on these anti-Semitic tropes, one of which, it was, it was a shocking one. When he came back from that trip that I talked about when he changed all those policies, he comes back from that. He's at a meeting with the wealthiest Jewish donors to the Republican Party. It's called, I forget what it's called, something like the Republican Jewish Committee, maybe, something like that. And they're the donors, basically, that, you know, they're very wealthy. And he looks around the room and he says, when I, when I announced that we were recognizing Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights, I was with your prime minister. And not one of them raised their hand and said, sorry, he's not our prime minister, we're Americans. You're our president, we don't have a prime minister. That, he's Israel's prime minister. 
And then he looked around and he pinpointed the two biggest donors. And he said, Sheldon and Miriam, I did it for you, when he was talking about Jerusalem. Sheldon and Miriam Adelson, Sheldon Mir Adelson is dead now, but the two of them were by far the biggest donors to the Trump campaign, to all kinds of pro-settler organizations in the US and inside Israel. And he used these anti-Semitic claims, I did it for you, implying that you know it's only about the money. So this is, this is real anti-Semitism that matched his pro-Israel policies. So I appreciate your concern about it. And the, the key is, see it as a matter of rights. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, has taken up the struggle against anti-Semitism because they recognize they all come from white supremacy. That's the origins of it, and that's what we have to fight against. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. People are leaving. Yeah. All right. Uh, in spite of the polls that you quote, uh, American Jews are probably the first or second most loyal groups from a voting standpoint that the Democrats have. Mm -hmm. Some 70 or 80 percent of yeah. American Jews vote Democratic in right. every election. Uh, but that's not my point. Um, it, it would seem that there's been a deliberate policy, you know, for the last 50 years to um, encourage settlements on the West Bank in such a way as to make a contiguous Palestinian state impossible. Exactly. Right? So that being the case, uh, there'll probably never be a Palestinian state as such, so, so far as I can see. Uh, on the other hand, Israel is a democracy. So in, it, it, at some point, if the West Bank is annexed and a democracy calls for all people participating in voting, Israel won't be a, dem a, a Jewish democracy anymore because there'll be more right. Arabs than Jews right. within Israel. That's right. Given that, I don't see how this situation that we've been talking about today, you know, can ever be rectified, ever solved. Okay, I would just say quickly, because I know we have to leave, that I don't think that being a Jewish democracy is guaranteed in international law. Being a democracy means one person, one vote. And that means, right, it, Israelis would not, um, Israeli Jews would not be the dominant um, demographic force anymore. And that's fine with me. And you know, I don't think that we, there's some right to being the dominant majority. Uh, you certainly don't have the right to expel other people or to destroy their homes or prohibit refugees from coming back to their own homes because you want to be the dominant, uh, um, the dominant group in a particular territory. That's, it just doesn't work that way, or shouldn't. It has worked that way for 50 years, but it shouldn't, in my view. But thank you. Can I say, sorry, yeah. for, for, the students who asked for the students who asked questions, if I can just throw out a couple of sites to, in terms of self-education and thinking about the future. There is the um, One Democratic State Campaign, which is um, a coalition of mostly Palestinian. It, it's, as far as I can tell, on the West Bank has become, they're sort of done with the Palestinian Authority, and there is some youth who are just pressing. They're like, okay, done. You won. We're part of Israel, and now we just want our rights, pressing for actually integration into Israel as full Israeli citizens. So um, if you'd like to look up, uh, the One Democratic State Campaign. It's Palestinian and some smaller number of Israelis, but mostly Palestinian and international advocates. Again, looking to the future. There's one state. There's not going to be two. There's one, but what kind of state is it going to be? Um, there's also a really nice um, uh, progressive. It's, nine seven, it's either plus 972, 972 magazine. 972 is the area code that um, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza share. Um, and it's one of the few places where you have progressive left-wing Israelis and Palestinians both writing. Um, so in terms of educating yourself and maybe becoming part of a community that is like <laughs> imagining a future, <laughs> um, I, would, I would encourage you to check that out. And also the BDS network. So, so you know, um, yeah, if we despair, the bad guys win, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, if we if we despair, the bad guys win. <laughs> so sorry, I just wanted to put that out there in the sense that.